Okay. Well, first off, I have to start off by saying whenever I wear this shirt to class, someone is always like, are you dressed like Data from Star Trek? And the first time it happened, I had no idea what they were talking about. But it turns out I am. <laughs> Anyways, so why not throw it in a recording, right? Uh, okay, so chapter seven, part two. Part two is where we're actually gonna start to fit the best, the line of best fit. Uh, and of course, this is part two of regression. Remember, regression is just a fancy term for line of best fit, right? And in fact, we're gonna be fitting a line by least squares regression. So there are many types of regression that we could fit, uh, but for linear regression, least squares is, is the one that's the most common. So of course, um, that's the only one that we really, really truly use. We'll talk about some other options and why we landed on the least, least squares regression line, uh, but we have to cover a little bit of ground before then. So uh, a linear regression line, right? If we have a scatter plot, I guess I could have used the one from last day, right? We've got um, an X variable and a Y variable. The Y variable is the response variable and the X variable is the explanatory variable, right? And so, and then of course we have some data points here. Boop, 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 da, 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 da. Right. And then we fit our line of best fit. Right. And this is going to be our least squares regression line. Okay. So the whole goal here is to be able to use this data. So this line is built from the data that we have, right? Uh, but the reason that we, we build this line is so that we can predict future values, right? Not necessarily later on in values of X, but just so that we have a good idea that, okay, if we, okay, just a second. Okay. Uh, I sort of forgot what I was saying, but uh, the goal is not necessarily to predict values in the future, but uh, future values of X in this range, right? So the least squares regression line is built from the data that we have, from the data, right? And we use the line, we use the line to predict future values of y. Okay. So that means that this line, right, we're going to be able to plug in some value of x and get some predicted value of y. And so we need notation, of course, for the predicted value of y. And so we have y hat is the predicted value of y, okay? Now, uh, we've seen p hat, right? Uh, let's just do a little um, versus p hat is the sample proportion. From chapter six. Right. Uh, those hats are very different, right? So this hat is, if it's on a Y, then it's the predicted value of Y and we're fitting a least squares regression line. And that's completely different from P hat, which is the sample proportion from chapter six, where we had, you know, uh, 13 out of 20 college students said yes on a survey, right? That would be a sample proportion and that would be your P hat. Uh, so it's really going to be based off of context, which, which hat it is. 
right? But we're really only using p hat and y hat, and so they should be pretty easy to keep track of, right? And so this for this chapter, y hat is the predicted value of y. Okay, so um, notice, right, that once we've drawn our line of best fit, which we'll talk about the, me the mechanism of how do we do that, how do we calculate the line of best fit, then we can predict values using the line. Uh, and we can also estimate the error, right? And so a couple of uses for the least squares regression line. Now I'm just going to grab some more notes here. Okay, so uh, we said we're going to predict values using the line, but we can also estimate the error. Remember from uh, part one, right, the error is the residual, which is the actual value, so the actual y minus the predicted y, right? So what we're going to find is that each point, right, each point in our data set has an actual value of y, right, at that value of x, but we could also calculate the predicted value of y at that value of x, right? And so that's what we talked about uh, at the end of last day. And so from there, that's how the least squares regression line kind of evolved. Uh, we want a line that has small residuals, right? We want a line that uh, is close to as many points as possible. So uh, thinking back to, you know, how did this all come about? What, how, how did they get there? Um, if you want to minimize that distance, so minimizing a distance between a point and a line, uh, there are a couple of options that you have, right? And so the first option that they, I say they, uh, statisticians from way, way, way back, right, um, that they looked at was maybe we should minimize the sum of the magnitudes, right? So the magnitude being that, that distance, right, whether it's positive or negative, you just, if it's negative, you just drop the negative by taking the absolute value of it. Um, so that's, that's one option, right? We can minimize the sum of the magnitudes. Okay, great. Uh, option two is the one that we landed on, the collective we. Um, so what if we minimize the sum of the squared residuals? Now thinking about uh, what happens if you square a value? Well, squared values are always positive, right? If you square negative two, you get positive four, right? And so, um, so squaring it is another way that we can kind of get rid of negatives that kind of counteract um, those positive distances. So we can minimize the sum of the squared residuals and that's what we call least squares. And so this is the one that we, we use. We use this method, okay? Which says that you take each residual and you square it and then you add it up. And whichever line generates the smallest sum, right? So minimizes that, that sum, that's the line of best fit, okay? Uh, why do we use it? Well, it's the most commonly used, so we should probably stick with that, right? Um, it's easier to compute by hand and using software, of course. <laughs> Anything that's easy by hand is also easy using software. But you have to remember that these things originated from a time when, when software was not available. So, uh, so that's why we've kind of picked this path and, and stuck with it. And kind of the final note is that a lot of the time, a residual twice as large as another is usually more than twice as bad. So if you think about a residual of two, right? Two squared would be four, right? Uh, and then you think of a, a residual twice as large, so four, four squared is 16. So we've got this jump of four to 16. And notice, right, so, so the distance between the residuals is still two, right, but the, the distance between the residuals squared is, is a lot larger. And so that's to penalize those 
uh, those larger residuals. So a residual of four has a bigger penalty than a residual of two, right? And so that's how we kind of um, get this line as close to all the points as possible. Okay. Um, okay, good. So in terms of the line, let me go grab it. Okay. So just like before, right, uh, with, um, I don't know, everything that we've done so far, inference especially, right? So we take our, our sample mean X bar and we're trying to predict uh, or we're trying to figure out what the population mean might be, right? So we're doing inference to try to figure out what the population mean is, right? And so just like we had X bar versus mu, now, uh, we're, we're really trying to figure out this overall, overall population line of best fit. And so this is the population line of best fit, right? And so what we have is we have y hat, which is the predicted value of y still. Oh actually have it here, so I'm not going to draw it out again. That would be weird. Uh, so this is the predicted value of y. Uh, sure. We're going to have uh, beta naught is, uh, is the intercept for the population. So that's what we're trying to estimate, but we are going to actually find a sample intercept. Okay, and so the parameter is beta naught. Beta is of course a B, so for our statistic, we use B naught, uh, not being a subscript zero, right? You could say beta zero, B zero, uh, but I just, I like to stick with not. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, so beta naught is the intercept. And then we've got, <clears throat> Beta one is the slope, the slope of the population. Now, of course, kind of similarly to the, the intercept, the statistic is gonna be B1. So B1 is going to be the slope. Uh, and then finally, we have our X, which is our explanatory variable. Now, this is just the holding kind of holding cell, I guess. Uh, and that's where we put in whatever value of X and then we predict Y. So for us, right, we're gonna have Y hat is B zero plus B one X, right? Will be the line of best fit. So again, whatever is attached to the X, this is the slope and whatever is on its own is the intercept. Notice that if you think about Y equals MX plus B, right? You might be familiar with, be familiar with, the general equation of a line. Y equals MX plus B, right? But again, the M is the slope and the B is the intercept. A little bit confusing because we use two Bs, right? But this one has no subscript. So you, it, it's all important, right? And so uh, in this case, because this is the B on its own, uh, that's, that's what makes it the intercept, right? And so notice the value attached to X is the slope. Right, and then knowing that, of course, the one that's not attached to an X is the intercept. 
Okay, so uh, so that's the general equation of a line, but you can see here that there's this kind of uh, symmetry. Right? You can even do something weird like uh, you could even do y hat because now I'm talking about a predicted line or just y if you want uh, is a plus bx. Right? Think about what which one would be the slope. Well, here b is the slope and a is the intercept. Right. So it all just it has nothing to do with the placeholder, right? A and B or B1, B0, uh, M or B. I, I don't actually know. So sometimes people ask me why, um, why is it MX plus B? I, I don't actually know the, the story behind it, but it might be interesting to look up. So it has nothing to do with the actual placeholder. So as long as you remember that whatever is attached to the X is a slope, and then the one that's on its own is the intercept, and you're good. Yeah. And so, all right, how do we calculate these things? Now, let me just go grab it. Actually, haha. -ha. Let's go to your formula sheet instead. So we're in section 7.2. Uh, 7.1 is from last day, and so we've already gone through that. Notice that uh, this is kind of the end of the road for the formula sheet. And let's just take a moment and scroll through and look at everything that you've covered. And I know it felt daunting in the beginning when you first saw this. Oh, man. We're going to go through all that? Yikes. Uh, but here we are almost at the end and you did it. Um, so I wanna introduce this here, but before we do, we're not gonna do this section necessarily, um, but it's just inference for the slope. And so, and you can do inference for the correlation, right? And so you can kind of poke around here. I wanted to include it so that you can see that in either case, you're gonna get a T which you know how to handle, right? So here, I just kind of let you go and you, you have the tools that you need to solve so many more of these problems than what we've seen in the class. So anyways, um, back to life, all right. So on your formula sheet, what I've done is I give you the least squares regression line a y hat is beta or b0 plus b1x. And then I say with slope, and I actually tell you that b1 is the slope, right? And I also tell you how to find it. It's the correlation times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. Now we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, there are a couple of ways that we might have to find the correlation, right? So it might not be given to us explicitly but we can, we can get there, right? And so um, might be some work, but usually I like to kind of keep it simple. So, um, so you've got the correlation times the standard deviation of your y's over the standard deviation of your x. This is where it becomes really, really important that of course you've got your y in the numerator and your x in the denominator. So if you have those turned around, then you're gonna get the wrong slope. Okay, so I want to kind of highlight here that B1 with the slope, right? So I'm, I'm telling you a lot of information here. And then it seems weird at first to introduce B1 first. But the reason that we do is because we need to find B1. So we need the slope in order to find the intercept, right? And so the intercept is down here. Right? And notice that from here, we need the slope first in order to find the intercept. 
which I'll make a note of. We will always need to find the slope first. Um, in order to use it to solve for the intercept. All right. So uh, that's a little bit tricky, right? But because uh, if you get the slope wrong, then you're going to use the wrong number in the y-intercept. But that's where follow through becomes so important. So as long as you know, well, you want to make sure that your slope is good because everything hinges on it. But even if it's not, then uh, if, if it's the case that I'm marking your work, then of course I would follow through. Uh, and if not, I try to set up the question so you're not you know, hinging on the wrong number throughout. Okay, so uh, let me, Grab some more notes here. Okay, so the slope of the regression, there are other formulas, but this one I find is the, the easiest to, to kind of handle. And with the R in here, so with the correlation in here, you might have to solve for the correlation, right? It might not be given to you, but we have those tools already, right? And so here, where, where R is the correlation, SY is the standard deviation of Y, and of course SX is the standard deviation of X. And those are both sample standard deviations, right? Because they're a lowercase s, right? And so notice how important it is uh, to have your x's and y's sorted out. We are, of course, going to do an example, but there's a little bit of theory. So I'm going to save the example for the very end, and then I'm going to run you through, uh, or I guess we're going to run through all the different questions that I could ask you for a regression question. Right. And so I'm kind of holding off until we have all those skills and then we'll do a long example. Hopefully it doesn't feel too long, but it is quite long. It's a lot of, a lot of parts. So I, I'll get you to calculate the slope, right? And then I often get you to interpret the slope. Now for that, of course, we need the definition of the slope. So the slope is by definition, for each unit increase in x, we will see a slope increase in the predicted value of y, right? So if you think about um, y hat equals uh, b0 plus b1x, right? If we increase x by one unit, right, going from three to four, for example, right? then we're gonna see a slope increase because the slope is multiplying that x, right? We're gonna see a slope increase in the predicted value of y, right? So you can get the, def you can get the definition uh, from just the, the line, right? And of course the intercept is just held steady. It doesn't change with an increase in x, okay? And so next thing we're going to do is talk about the intercept. So the intercept is where the regression line intersects the y-axis, right? So you've got your x-axis and your y-axis, and then you've got your line of best fit. So wherever it crosses the y-axis, that is your y-intercept, and that's your uh, b0 in this case. And so uh, just as like a fun fact, this the line of best fit will always pass through the one point which is at x bar y bar. So you take your average of all your x's and the average of all your y's, and then at that one point, the line of best fit just by how the definition of it works, it will pass through x bar y bar, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, and so what we do is we say, okay, well, at some point when X bar or when X is X bar and Y hat then becomes Y bar, right? And if we know B1, then we can solve for B0. And that's how we arrived at this formula, right? You don't have to do that. I'm just kind of showing you if you're interested, uh, but I didn't even really show you. I just talked you through it, but anyways, so B0 is Y bar minus B1, which is the slope times X bar, right? And so here, where B1 is the slope from earlier, Y bar is the sample mean of Y, and the X bar is the mean of X, I didn't say sample, I should, maybe I, I didn't need to say sample, mean of Y, just the mean of Y, it's fine. So then if we think about the definition of the intercept, well, the intercept is the value when X is zero, right? So it's, it's, it becomes the predicted value of Y, Y hat, when X is zero. Right, so if we let x be zero here, this b1x would go away, right, and become zero, and then y hat equals b naught. Now, so that's where our definition of the intercept comes from. So uh, the predicted value of y when x is zero. Yeah. So here, right, if we go back to that example with the percentage in poverty and the percentage of high school grads, uh, what we can do is we can rewrite our equation and we're actually going to find the, the slope and the intercept for this data. Um, but what we can do, just so you know, is that we could write, we could write just y hat is b0 plus b1x or if you prefer, right, because the percentage in poverty is the y, you could do percentage in poverty with a big hat over it. How do you read that? You're going to read it as the predicted percentage in poverty, right? Is b0 plus b1. And then instead of just a generic x, this is just the placeholder for uh, the percentage of high school grads, right? Because here you've got your percentage of high school grads as your X. So percent high school grad, right? And so this is just a placeholder um, a placeholder for any value of X. Okay. And maybe, maybe it makes more sense to have it all on one line. There. Okay. So, so we could write it kind of generically like this, and that's what's on your formula sheet, but Sometimes I find that it helps if I articulate what the X and the Y are, then it's more obvious that, okay, my intercept and my slope, those are going to be numbers, right? Which I calculate and I find, and then I have these kind of placeholders. I'm gonna plug in some value of X and figure out what the predicted value of Y is. And so that's why we build these regression lines. All right, so. Grab some more notes here. Okay, so like I said, there are a couple of things that I want to touch on before we can actually go through and calculate the slope and the intercept. Uh, and they're just warnings, right? And so the main warning with uh, using our least squares regression line to predict new values, because that's, that's what we're going to use it for. Uh, but we have to remember that our line was built from data that has a range of x, right? So, or um, if you've gone too far into math, it doesn't make sense when I say range. I should be saying domain of x, but that 
sounds scary if you haven't gone deep into math. So anyways, uh, it's built off of some interval of X, right? So if we look at the percentage in poverty data and the percentage of high school grads, notice that these values of X go from, let's say 70 to 95-ish, right? And so our values of X are, are somewhere between 70 and 95. So when we think about the intercept, for example, right? What does that look like? Well, that means that our data is way down here and yeah, our line of best fit because of the nature of lines, lines continue forever and ever and ever, right? They extend to positive infinity and negative infinity. And so uh, for that reason, right, our intercept might be way, way outside of kind of the realm of our values in our data set. So a term for that is called extrapolation. It's when we use the line that we've made to make predictions outside the range of this data. And um, what happens when we do that, so our, going back to this one, our data here, right, between 75 and, or 70 and 95-ish, right, this line seems to be doing a pretty good job of capturing this behavior. There's no reason to uh, kind of think twice about this line. It looks like it's doing what, what we want it to do. Uh, what happens is we don't know what the data might look like outside the range of this, uh, of this kind of 75 to, or 70 to 95-ish, right? And so here's where I'm getting this kind of 70 to 95, right? So values of X outside of this range right, are gonna be less reliable. It might still be our best guess, right? So we can still use the line to predict for values of X that might be, you know, 50 or something weird, right? So put in an X value of 50, and then we get this crazy high percentage in poverty. That's our best guess. But because 50, an X of 50 is outside the range of our data, then that prediction is not very reliable, right? And so the term that we use for that is extrapolation. Okay. And so I, <clears throat> applying a model estimate, so applying the model that we built to values outside the realm of the original data is called extrapolation. So let's highlight that. Okay. Sometimes the intercept might be an extrapolation. If the intercept is outside the, the range of the data, uh, then it would be an extrapolation. And that's okay. Uh, it's just something to remember. So extrapolation is the use of a regression line. And I'll highlight extrapolation again. Uh, is the use of a regression line for prediction far outside the range of values of the explanatory variable X that you use to obtain the line. Such predictions are often not accurate. What I will add here is uh, extrapolations, oops, extrapolations might still be your best guess, but they are not very reliable, right? So there's kind of that trade-off, yikes. I've even got this little hand thingy to help me out, but it looks like my writing got worse. Um, so extrapolations, might still be your best guess, right? If, if you have nothing else to go off of, you might have to extrapolate. But then in your report, you would need to acknowledge that, hey, I was extrapolating here. And so this prediction might not be very reliable, right? But it is, it's all I've got, okay? And so thinking about relationships in general, right? So few relationships are linear for all values of X. 
which it, that's to, just to say that we can't use this straight line. A lot of the time, the straight line only applies for a short section of our data. Uh, so you don't want to make predictions far outside the range of your X. For example, and this is just to highlight um, one problem that we could face. A lot of the time we have some background knowledge. For example, we all know that at some age we kind of stop growing, right? And so you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow kind of steadily on a linear, uh, with a linear relationship, right, as you age. Um, and then at some point we start to plateau, right? And so we understand that. Uh, but sometimes we might not have that understanding of the background of the data, right? And so that's why you want to kind of hold off if you find yourself extrapolating. So if you think about uh, a child's growth between the ages of three and eight, right? You find a strong linear relationship, probably positive, right? As the age increases, their height increases, just guessing. Um, you find a strong linear relationship between the age X and the height Y. If you fit a regression line and use it to predict the height at 25 years old, you would be predicting that the child would be eight feet tall, right? And so you've got data on kids between the ages of three and eight, right? And so then if you're plugging in uh, an X value of 25, right, 25 years old, then your prediction is, is unreliable, right? Because we're extrapolating. Okay. Uh, all right, my next warning is about time series, but let me just bring it up here. Okay, so like I said, my next warning is about time series. Now time series are a special case where the explanatory variable is time. Now that can be in seconds, it can be in hours, it can be in days, months, quarters, years. Um, it can be any measure of time. Uh, and so of course, especially in business, uh, kind of financial data, you've got quarterly reports, you've got uh, annual earnings, you've got kind of uh, clicks per, per day, you know, all that kind of fun data that you're dealing with. And all of those are time series. Now, one of the things that we've been assuming for our linear regression is that each point is independent of all the other points. That's no longer true for time series often, okay? And so, uh, time series are special in the sense that observations are often no longer independent as we move through time. So just as an example, if you think about stock prices and you're trying to model stock prices, uh, well, the price today depends on the price yesterday, right? And so then you've got this kind of relationship and it keeps rolling over and they're no longer independent. There are so many tools available. And I, I wanna say time series analysis is like its own field. So I'm not even gonna be able to touch on or get into anything really deep, uh, but just be aware of what time series are and that you lose that independence um, as you move through time, right? And you, so uh, you have to account for that. Of course, the goal with time series is still to model that random behavior. So to try to predict future values. Uh, usually we call it forecasting in that, in that sense. Uh, and so we want to do some time series analysis, uh, which, like I said, there are lots of different tools that we have available. Uh, and they're all, you know, pretty cool, um, but they're all trying to model that random behavior, right? It, it, we've all seen the stock prices, up, 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 they're going up, 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 shaky, 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 up, 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 and then shaky, shaky, down, 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 ugh, and then shaky, shaky, up, 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 right? And so we're trying to model that kind of, um, that vibration there, 
Okay. And so we're trying to model the random behavior as well as we're trying to capture trends, right? There might be uh, some trends, there might be seasonality, right? So the trend would be maybe it's just constant, constantly increasing, right? But it's kind of shaking as it's increasing. Uh, there might be seasonality, meaning uh, it, just as the word implies, right? Maybe it changes with the seasons, right? And that could be with the quarters, it could be annually. So, you know, every year it turns over uh, and you have to adjust for that, right? Um, I don't know, thinking about ice cream sales, it sounds stupid, but uh, ice cream sales, of course, there's that seasonality. They're not expecting to make as much money in the winter as they do in the summer. Right, but they want to try to account for that in their model. Uh, and then we could have cyclical behavior. Cyclical behavior is not necessarily seasonality, but where at some point it just kind of uh, starts over again. So it doesn't have to do with a certain time in the year, right? Uh, but it could have this kind of okay, every four years it starts over and then it plummets and then it goes back up and then it plummets and then it goes back up, right? That would be cyclical behavior. Uh, and then of course the end goal is to use this model to forecast future values, okay? And so uh, the goal is to try to model all that behavior and then the model is used to forecast future values, okay? Which are extrapolations, right? Because we don't have data for 2025, right? We're trying to predict what's gonna happen then, for example, right? And I've got a little example here, which is kind of cute. It's, it's a warning about extrapolation, uh, but it's also a look at time series. And so uh, how they found this data, I have no idea. But uh, anyways, so they've collected the men's age at first marriage, first marriage, uh, <laughs> from the 1900s up until, you know, 1990 something, presumably. So there was a, a linear relationship here up until I am going to go ahead and guess uh, the war looks like. I don't think I'm that far off. And then something happened, right? Uh, the men started marrying super, super, super young. Fair enough, okay. Uh, and then come the 1975, all of a sudden they start waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting longer for their first marriage. Now, this blue line, right? If we use the data from the 1900s to let's say even 1950 here, we've got a relatively linear relationship, a strong negative linear relationship, which we could model with a straight line and that's fine. But so then what happens when we try to use this line to predict the men's age at first marriage uh, for 1960, which would be maybe here, right? Then we're over predicting the age because something else happened in our data, right? And so here we've got time on the x-axis, so this is a time series, right? And so it would require some special analyses, right? And special considerations. Okay, Oy. Now, uh-huh. How we, decide if a line of best fit is good uh, and you can call them goodness of fit. It doesn't really apply to this, but uh, there is such a thing as goodness of fit, even though it sounds ridiculous. Um, but we want to measure the strength of the fit of a linear model. And what we use most commonly is called R squared. Now, R squared is exactly what it sounds like. R squared is the square of the correlation coefficient, which is just R. So something, I don't know why, uh, but R squared is R squared. Okay. And for that reason, R squared is the square root 
of our scope, oh, sorry. <laughs> R is the plus minus square root of R squared. Now, right, R squared is some measure and it's the correlation squared. But remember when you square a value, then you lose whether it's positive or negative, right? And so you'd have to look at uh, would need to look at the relationship to determine if it is positive or negative. Okay. So R squared, it, it tells us how good our line is at predicting future values. So it tells us the percentage of variability in the response variable Y, uh, how much of it is explained by the least squares regression line on the explanatory variable. Now this is the definition of R squared. Okay. So it tells us the percentage of variability in Y that's explained by the least squares regression line on X. Keyword here is going to be percentage of variability. So as soon as you see percentage of variability, I want your mind to say R squared. What does R squared do? It tells us kind of how good our line fits our data. Okay. Uh, so anything that's outside of R squared is going to just be uh, activity that we can't capture with the line or maybe we've kind of not included an important variable that we should be including in our uh, regression line. Okay. Let me just clean up here. Okay, I'm back. You wouldn't believe it, but I had a meeting in between there. So I've kind of lost track of where we were, but here we go. So the R squared tells us kind of how good of a job our line does at predicting values. Now for that reason, right? Uh, we want a high R squared, right? And notice that because the correlation is between negative one and one, right? So R squared is between zero and one, right? Or 0% and 100%, okay? So we want a high R squared. Now, it kind of depends on the data that you have and the scenario that you have. Uh, and so some fields are happy with an R squared that's like anything like 30%, uh, whereas other fields would be just really disappointed with an R squared of 80%, for example. So that's kind of tricky. Uh, but depending on your field, you'll get a sense of, okay, what's a good R squared and what's a, what's a bad R squared. But in general, we're looking for as high an R squared as possible, right? And so, um, and it is a percentage, but of course, for our calculations, you should be using a decimal version. So just to remember, that you can find a regression line for any relationship between two uh, quantitative or numerical variables. Uh, why did I say quantitative there? That sounds weird. Uh, I've been saying numerical. Oh, well, we're flexible. Okay. But the usefulness of the line depends on the strength of the linear relationship. And so that's where the R squared comes in because that's gonna capture the strength of the linear relationship. So the R squared is almost as important as the equation of the line in reporting a regression. So what you'll find in Excel, for example, uh, which is really like a click, click, click situation, um, kind of click and you get what you want. 
Uh, if you have a scatter plot in Excel and you add a trend line, which is going to add the line of best fit, it also reports the R squared to tell you that, hey, this is how, how good this line is for predicting future values, right? So um, I, I know I'm being vague about it, but we want a high R squared, right? So, and it's kind of uh, situation and data dependent on what high is. And usually anything over, let's say, 80% is considered really good. Okay. So, but notice I'm not really writing it down because it's, I'm non-committal. All right. So we've talked about kind of the, uh, the cautions that we have to keep in mind for regression. So if we have a time series, that's going to require time series analyses, which is like this whole other rabbit hole that we could go down. Uh, or if we're extrapolating in general, then we need to keep that in mind, right? We can still do it. We can still use the line to predict values um, outside uh, the range of our, our data, but we have to remember that those, those predictions are not very reliable necessarily, right? And uh, we talked about how do we find the slope and the intercept, and uh, now we're ready to actually apply it. And so I've got this big example for us to work through. So given the following information about the percentage of high school grads and percentage in poverty data, right, we're given the mean and the standard deviation of each of the variables. Notice that uh, there's going to be a mean of the percentage of high school grads, which is your X bar, and a standard deviation of the percentage of high school grads, which is your SX. And then uh, mean of the percentage in poverty is Y bar, and the standard deviation of the percentage in poverty is SY. We're also given the covariance, which is SXY uh, is negative 8.67. So uh, that's the information that we have. And now we're going to go through. And what I want to do is I want to read through these questions with you and then give you a moment to pause it here uh, or there, I guess, and work through those problems and see how much of it you can figure out on your own. And then we'll meet back here and, and go through it like we usually do. So the first thing I ask you to do is to find the correlation between the percentage of high school grads and the percentage in poverty. Right? So you have to find the correlation. Then you have to find the slope. Then you have to interpret the slope. Now, when you're interpreting the slope, you're going to apply the definition of the slope to the number that you found. Okay? Then you're going to find the intercept. And again, you're going to interpret the intercept, which again is just applying the definition of the intercept to the number that you found. Then we're going to put that all together and find the least squares regression line um, of percentage in poverty as a function of the percentage of high school grads. So that's just putting together our y hat equals b0 plus b1x, right? With our b0 and b1 already solved for. Then just to show you what's going on, uh, I want you to try to draw the least squares regression line on the scatter plot. Now the scatter plot is here. And so we can already see that we've got some imaginary line of best fit here. And we're going to kind of sketch out what it might look like. Okay, uh, this is optional. So um, you don't have to, but it's a good practice to try to draw a line, right? And understanding where this line comes from. Remember to draw a line, to draw any straight line. Uh, and I use this all the time, just kind of in real life. Um, I like to do woodworking. And so like when you're cutting wood, right, you need to have straight lines. And how do you do that? Well, you really only need two points. And then if you could connect them with a straight edge, then you can extend the line and then you have a straight line. So uh, even just in real life, I use that quite often. It's just how do you draw a straight line? Well, you need two points that are on the line, connect them, and then you're done. All right, and so that's what you're gonna use for part G when you draw the regression line. 
Then we're going to use the regression line to predict the percentage in poverty. We're going to use the equation, of course, because using the, the line that we drew, uh, well, there's an error there because we drew it, right? And so uh, I want you to use the equation to predict the percentage in poverty of a state with a, an 80% high school graduation rate. Then in the next part, we're going to predict the percentage in poverty of a state with an with a 50% high school graduation rate. And then I follow it up with, do you trust this prediction, right? And that's just to nudge you in the direction of what? Well, stay tuned. Uh, and then J, extrapolation. Uh, what percentage of variability in percentage in poverty is explained by the least squares regression line on the percentage of high school grads? So here, Remember, as soon as you see percentage of variability, I want your mind to kind of click in and say R squared, right? And then just to keep reading, obviously, just to confirm that, okay, she is asking me for R squared. So here you would calculate your R squared. So I'll give you an opportunity to pause it here and then uh, we'll meet back here and do these uh, calculations and answer these questions. Okay. So we'll start with part A, of course. And first thing we have to do is find the correlation between uh, the percentage of high school grads, which is our X and the percentage in poverty, which is our Y, mostly from our scatter plot, right? Which axis is it on? Okay. All right, so if we want the correlation, the correlation is R. We don't have the correlation here, but we do have the components that we need. So from our formula sheets, remember, we have kind of two main ways of finding the correlation. Either it's this nasty calculation. Luckily for us, we don't have the data, so we can't do this calculation, but we do have uh, everything that we need to just calculate it like this. So that's what I mean by, okay, you might not have the correlation, but you do have the components to calculate it. And so here we go. So R is going to be SXY, which is negative 8.67, divided by the standard deviation of X, which is 3.73 times the standard deviation of Y, which is 3.10. So once I calculate this out, I'm gonna get a decimal approximation and I guess I better do it here, negative 8.67 divided by, and you wanna make sure that you multiply these before you divide them into negative 8.67 but uh, hopefully you're comfortable with that. And I'm getting a correlation of roughly negative 0.7498054138. Of course it keeps going, but my calculator kind of gaps out there. Uh, it doesn't say how many decimal places and so I'm just looking here and it looks like if I end at the eight, I've captured a lot of what's going on here. So one, two, three, four decimal places, sure. So R is going to be negative 0.7498 to four decimal places. And I just picked four decimal places just kind of out of the blue. So. Um, if you wanted to keep more, then that's great. But now that I've rounded, I'm just going to use that rounded value in my future calculations, right? And that's, that's totally fine. Okay, so we found the correlation. Next thing we have to do is find, what I made it smaller, uh, find the slope. Okay. So the slope, if you go back to your formula sheet, the slope is from the least squares regression line. I'm just gonna grab this whole chunk here. All right, 
the slope is the correlation, which we just found, surprise, surprise, times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. Notice that we already have those two components. So we have everything that we need. And so B1 is R times SY over SX, which is, so B1, which is the, uh, which is a slope is negative 0 0.7498 times SY 3.10 over SX 3.73. Okay. Notice if you switch these around. In this case, they're they're fairly similar, but it'll still change the the slope to be the very wrong number, right? So you want to make sure that you've got your x's and y's sorted out and using them properly. So now if we go ahead and do 3.10 divided by 3.73 and then times negative 0.7498. I end up with a slope of roughly negative 0.62315817169. But because I'm using a rounded value to four decimal places here, it seems logical to round to four decimal places again. So that's what I'm going to do. So negative 0.6232. Right. One is followed by five, so we have to round it up. Okay, so now I've got the slope and let me just clean up here. Okay, so we've got the slope. We've got a negative slope, which looks good, right? We want it to be negative because we have a negative relationship, right? And so, and that's gonna come from the negative correlation, which ultimately came from a negative covariance, right? Because the standard deviations themselves uh, have to be positive. You can't have negative, negative spread, uh, right? And so the standard deviations have to be positive. So uh, now that we have the slope, negative 0.6232, and I'll just highlight that I went to four decimal places here, we can interpret the slope. In general, right, remember what the definition of the slope is. The slope says that for each unit increase in x, we're going to see a slope increase in the predicted value of y. Now, applying that to, uh, to this situation, right, for each unit increase in the percentage of high school grad, right, in general, this is x. Right, so for each unit increase in X, we expect to see a uh, negative 0.6232, which is the slope, increase, okay, and what I want to talk about here is um, uh, sorry, it's just a second here. No, it's the vet, but it's just a, a message, so it's okay. Um, so the slope, right, is negative, and then I say a negative increase. That is just me trying to keep the same format as so regardless of if the slope is positive or negative, but this comes out a little bit weird right a negative increase it's technically correct and that's why i'm keeping it right. Uh, but what we could say is we could say or. 0.6232 decrease. Right. But just what gets tr tricky here is you cannot say a negative 0.6232 decrease because a negative decrease would be an increase, right? And so even though it sounds funny, just to play it safe, 
I encourage you to just always put the slope value here and then follow it with an increase. So then if it's positive, it is an increase. If it's negative, then we understand that it is a decrease. So unless you're comfortable with making this kind of transition where you drop the negative and make it a decrease, sure, great, go for it. But to play it safe, I always just do the slope amount and then increase, right? So for each unit uh, increase in X, we expect to see a slope increase in the predicted value of Y in the predicted value of percentage in poverty, right? Which is our Y. Right. So notice how I take the general definition of the slope and I apply it to the number that I found. So the slope that I found, but also the variables that we have. Okay. So for each unit increase, so for each additional percentage in high school grads, right, we expect to see a negative 0.6232 increase or a 0.623 decrease in the predicted value of the percentage in poverty. Right, and so that's how we interpret the slope. Okay, so let's find the intercept. Uh, find the intercept. Okay. The intercept is from the formula sheet. And remember, that's the one that requires the slope. And we also need to remind ourselves, huh, copy, what those averages are. Okay, so we have B0 is Y bar, where Y bar is 11.35. minus B1, which was negative 0.6232. You have to be really careful, right? When you have a negative slope, a negative times a negative makes a positive, right? So you'll wanna keep track of that. Uh, and then multiplied by X bar, which was 86.01. Okay, so I have to multiply 86.01 times negative 0.6232, which is, uh, so B0 is 11.35 minus negative 53.601432. Why not? Okay. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is, can you imagine the disaster if you had swapped 11.35 with 86.01, right, and used them? It would give you a completely different number, right? And so that's why it's so important that at the very beginning of the problem, you really establish and convince yourself that you have the right value for, or the right variable for y and the correct variable for x, right? Otherwise, things will just um, go crazy. So 11.35 minus that puts us at an intercept of 64.951432, which if I'm rounding to four decimal places, uh, 64 point, or maybe let's just go to two decimal places because I don't need that much action. And because it doesn't say, I'm just kind of freewheeling here and, and picking how many decimal places I want to do, uh, but also kind of trying to see what's reasonable. Um, uh, all right, so now I have the intercept at 64.95, and I guess I should not have it look like there's two decimal places, there's only one. Uh, 64.95. Okay. So now it's time to interpret the intercept. 
And I want to add something here that I don't always ask, but it's sometimes I ask it and it's worthwhile knowing what's going on, right? So let's see here, I'll put it on a fresh page. After I get you to interpret the intercept, I might also ask, is it meaningful? Okay, so uh, is it meaningful? Okay, so first I want to interpret the intercept and again, doing the exact same thing that we did with the slope where I just take the definition of the intercept and I apply it to the values that I found in our variables. And then uh, we'll talk about what does it mean for it to be meaningful, right? It's going to hinge on the definition of the intercept, right? And so uh, interpret the intercept. Well, the definition of the intercept is that um, 64.95, which is the intercept, uh, is the predicted percent in poverty, right? It's the predicted Y or value of Y when percentage high school grads, when the percentage of high school grads is what? Which is your X? is zero. Okay, All right, so that's the, so the slope is the predicted, or sorry, the slope, the intercept is the predicted value of y, and maybe I'll clean this up and say value of y. Right. Percentage in poverty. Um, when x is zero, right? So uh, the intercept is the predicted value of y when x is zero. Now to address the is it meaningful, um, it's kind of tricky but also easy in the sense that whatever you argue, as long as you argue it based off of x being zero, you, you can't be wrong, right? Uh, you can argue that yes, it is meaningful because X can be zero. So in this case, the percentage of high school grads, uh, in my opinion, it's very unlikely that it would be zero and would still be a variable that we would use, right? So you could say, oh, well, there could be a case where there's no more high schools, then the percentage of high school grads would be zero. But then of course, we wouldn't be using it to make predictions anymore. So it's kind of like a, a catch 22, right? So uh, in my opinion, I what I would argue is that no, it's not meaningful because the percentage of high school grads would never be zero. So it's an extrapolation, right? Which is what we saw. Right. And often if if the if zero is not in your range of X's, then it, we usually end up saying that it's not meaningful. Right. And so uh, to answer. If the intercept is meaningful. Oh, that didn't is meaningful, we could argue one of two ways. No wrong answer, right? As long as you argue it properly, okay? So the first one is yes, it is meaningful because uh, percentage of high school grads uh, could be zero. 
That's your first option, right? Uh, or your second option is no, it is not meaningful because percentage high school grad can never be zero. Um, the intersect is an extrapolation. Okay. So in this case, I would pick this one, right? For this question, I would pick this one, right? But both of these I would consider reasonable arguments, but notice how we're really arguing whether X can or cannot be zero, right? And so uh, we are uh, arguing whether X can or cannot be zero, right? Is it reasonable to think that X could be zero? Yes or no? And then that's gonna be your answer to, uh, is it meaningful, right? Can X be zero? Okay, good. So now we have the slope, we have the intercept, we know what they mean, right? What their interpretations are. And so now we're gonna find the least squares regression line. Let's see here. So in general, and it's even on your formula sheet, right? Let me just grab it from here. This is from your formula sheet and you just end up plugging in your values, right? And so Y hat is B zero, which was 64.95, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, that's your intercept. I remember that my slope is negative. So I'm just gonna, you can go plus negative 0.6232. That's fine, but I'm just going to go straight to minus 0.6232 times x, right? Or you could write percentage in poverty, right? The predicted percentage in poverty is 64.95 minus 0.6232 times the percentage of high school grads. A lot of people tend to like this uh, second version better just because then it's obvious where the values should be going because our next step is to use this line, right? This is the least squares regression line is to use this line to predict new values, right? To predict the percentage in poverty. Okay? So uh, a lot of people like this one, uh, but if you like this one, that's totally fine too. Yeah. So I think I'm just going to clean up here. I forgot that we were drawing the least squares regression line. It is optional, but uh, since it's on here, we may as well go through and do it, right? So to draw a straight line, we need at least two points. I usually just do two because I'm lazy. And how I often set that up is I just kind of pick two values of X and they can be any value of X, right? And then I wanna find uh, the corresponding value of Y on the line. Now remember that your Y hat is 64.95 minus 0.6232 times X. For space reasons, 
uh, I'm using that shorter version. Okay, so what we do is we're just going to pick any two values of x that I want to plug in here. Now, for me personally, I like to pick values that are easy to see on my graph, right? We have to pick values of x that are inside the range of our data, right? Otherwise, I mean, we could go outside, but um, you should be picking values of x inside the range of your data. I'm interpolating, it's called. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick maybe, and maybe I'll change my line type to be all dashed, right? So here, try to straighten this out here. Yeah. So what if I pick 80? Okay. Oh, now the dashed line is kind of hard to see. Anyways, so here, right, I might pick 80. And then I might pick uh, 90 just for kind of good measure. Oops. Mm, kind of helps me cheat there by straightening out, right? And so here, oh, I did it again. Oops, I did it again. Right. You can pick any two values of x that you want. Uh, you could do like 81.5, but it might be really difficult to figure out where that is on this scale, right? So that's why I'm picking 80 and 90. You could pick 85, whatever. Uh, and so now, right, I'm going to find that y hat is 64.95 minus 0 0.6232 times 80. And maybe I'll use the same color there. Uh, and when I do that, right, what I'm doing is I'm predicting y when x is 8, right? So there don't seem to be any values that have exactly x. This one's close, but not exactly, right? And so that's okay. We can still predict values. So 80 times 0.6232 uh, and then 64.95, oops, helps if I type in the right number, minus that. I'm getting uh, a value of 15.094. Uh, so if I go across here and I find 15.094, uh, might be somewhere around here. Okay. So that would be my first point on the line. So now if I go to y hat, is 64.95 minus 0 0.6232 times and orange 90. Orangey glad I didn't say banana. I feel like I say that all the time. Um, 90 times 0 0.6232 and then 64.95 minus that puts me at, what's a color I haven't used yet? Ah, light blue, I guess, 8.862. There are a couple of things you can do to check in, right? You've got a negative relationship. So for a larger value of X, like we have, we're expecting our value of Y to be smaller. Uh, and that's what we're seeing, right? So, so things seem to be making sense so far. So that's good. So 8.862 might be somewhere here. And if we trace across here, we it would go somewhere like that. Okay. Now I'm all out of colors, but 
what I have is I have two points, right? I have two X, Y coordinates. And what I can do, and typically what I do is I just tell uh, for in-person classes, I just say, okay, well, use this as your straight edge. It's not perfectly straight, but it's straight enough. Or maybe outside the case is better, right? So then you just put this down over your two dots, line them up, and then connect the dots and extend the line. And then you're done. And on my iPad, I'm actually going to try to use uh, my calculator. It did not work very well. So I'm going to try a different approach where I just kind of wing it. Ah, it's still not working. Okay, different straight edge. Or I just give up. No, I'll never. So close. Okay, good enough. Right, so here, this line is the y hat equals 64.95 minus 0.6232x. So that is that line. And of course, it keeps going and going, but we only care about that small region. I'm really hoping that I didn't screw up the, the slope now that I'm thinking of it. Hopefully it is 0.6232 because that's what I've been using for a long time now. Good. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. So that's how you draw a straight line. That's totally optional. I'm not going to make you do that uh, necessarily. And if I am, then I'll warn you, but no. Um, but that's how you would do it. And that's how these lines are made, right? The, these lines, uh, the computer, because you're probably using a computer by this point, um, just plugs in all the different values of x, right? It just goes along the x-axis for all the values that you want to see, and then it predicts the values. And so this is just a series of, of many, 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 many dots, right? It's never actually a line, OK? All right, so now we're ready to do some more predictions. But notice that we've already done two predictions to make the line, right? So that's why it's a good question to get you to, to make predictions, but also understand what we're doing. OK, I said it before, but I think it's actually time to predict the percentage in poverty of a state. And we're given some criteria here. Uh, <clears throat> Predict the percentage in poverty. So how I want you to read this, predict, that's your Y, right? So predict Y, right, is really find Y hat of a state with an 80% high school graduation rate, right? And so X is going to be, this is tricky. Right here, it says 80%. And we know because we're good students, we're good math students, we know, okay, well, we do math with decimals, right? But notice that the scale here is in the percentage. And so for this, right, you want to match whatever the scale is on your graph, right? And whatever scale is given in the data, right? And so here, I'm scrolling up, percentage of high school grads, 86.01 is clearly a percentage already. Uh, and same with the percentage in poverty. And so uh, we want to keep it as a percentage. So you have to match whatever the information that's given to you in these cases. And that can be tricky, uh, but just with some practice, you'll get it. Hey, we already did it with an 80% graduation rate. Note to self, I should have done 85 here because it's not part of the question. Uh, but let's just do it for good measure here. Uh, so y hat 
is 64.95 minus 0 0.6232 times 80, which is 15.094. And I'll just say also done above. Okay. So that's good. So then the predicted percentage in poverty for a state with an 80% high school graduation rate is 15.094%, right? That's the predicted percentage in poverty. So oh, now we wanna do another prediction. And let's see here. Wow. So we want to predict the percentage in poverty of a state with, uh, I'm going to, there, with a 50% high school graduation rate. And then it follows it up with, do you trust this prediction? Right. And so if we look at our graph, and I'm just going to try to steal this portion here and delete everything. Dum, dum, dum. Okay. So if we think about, all right, our range of data goes from uh, roughly 70 to about 95 ish. Right, of course, our scale keeps going. Okay. Keeps going, oops. Like this. And so maybe 50 would be somewhere out here. Okay, we can still do that, right? We can have our line, which we found earlier, maybe looks like this and Kind of keeps going. We can make that prediction, right? But because we're extrapolating here, and so that's when you need to check on the range of your data versus the value of x that I'm asking you to use. And if it's outside that range, then your prediction is not as reliable, right? And so we can still do it. Y hat is 64.95 minus 0 0.6232 times 50. So I want to do 0 0.6232 times 50 and then 64.95 minus that. And I get a predicted value of 33.79. Right. Just remember that this is our best guess. Okay. Uh, but, and then here is kind of like the, do you trust this prediction? Since X equals 50 is outside the range of our data, since X equals 50 is, outside the range of our data, this prediction is an extrapolation and is unreliable, right? And so I don't trust this prediction. Add a page here. Therefore, I do not trust this prediction. You do have to say why, right? You do have to touch on the extrapolation part. And usually on the final exam, I'll have uh, people know that there's this word that they're supposed to remember and uh, in the explanation, no, I don't trust this prediction because 
it's that word that I can't remember what it is. So pretty funny. Um, but because it's an extrapolation, it's unreliable. And uh, that's why we can't trust this prediction. Yeah. So uh, good. So there's quite a few questions that I can ask. Uh, and usually they just kind of flow like this, right? Build on, on one another. Let's see here. Wow. The last question is, what percentage of variability and percentage in poverty is explained by the least squares regression line on the percentage of high school grads? Right, so here, as soon as you see percentage of variability, right, this is R squared, okay? And it's asking what R squared? So we have to find R squared. You can read on to confirm that it is saying the percentage of variability in Y is explained by the least squares regression line on X, right? And so this is the definition of uh, definition of R squared phrased as a question. Okay. So we have to remember that R squared is just R squared. Okay. And so we have the correlation. The correlation was uh, negative, now I can't remember, uh, negative point. Where is it? Here. I'm going to just copy this. So I don't have to remember. Who likes remembering stuff? Uh, negative 0.7498 squared. So R squared. And notice here, I'm just using a revolving door because I like to have what I'm solving for on the right hand side. Um, and so negative point, point seven four nine eight squared, once you square it, it has to become positive, right? If it didn't become positive, you forgot the brackets in your calculator, right? And so R squared is 0 0.5622004. Okay. okay. So it is asking for what percentage of variability. And so 56.22%, right? If I go to two decimal places. In general, you should just always uh, just read the question and see if it specifies how many decimal, pl decimal places and then just go with that. Uh, or if not, try to keep as many as you can. But because we've got all these zeros here, it's okay to kind of lob them off. Um, okay, so the answer would be 56.22, right? Uh, good. So another way that these questions can uh, kind of come about is remember, we started off by finding the correlation. Well, what if I told you that 56.22% of the variability in percentage in poverty is explained by the least squares regression line on percentage of high school grads and then find the correlation. Well, then we would need to, right, take the square root of this value, right, this 0.5622, and, and we would need to look at this graph, right, to see um, okay, we've got a negative relationship, so our correlation would need to be negative, right? And so that's another way that these can unfold. And there are a couple of practice problems in the, uh, or there are a couple of questions in the practice problems that 
let you practice that. So uh, just something to keep an eye out for. And maybe I'll... Um, a regression question might start with uh, something like 68% uh, of the percentage in poverty, or sorry, of the variability of the variability, variability helps if I can spell it. 68% of the variability in percentage in poverty, men. Is explained probably pause it so you don't have to suffer through this, uh, is explained by the least squares regression line on percentage of high school grants. What is the correlation? So notice, right now we're given R squared and need to find R, right? So here, right, R is the square root of R squared, but it's plus minus, which you have to figure out if it's positive or negative. So R is plus minus the root of 0.68 in this case, in my made up example. Uh, so the square root of 0.68 is roughly plus minus 0.82462111251, right? But since the relationship is negative, R is negative 0.8246 to four decimal places, All right? So that's how you would get the correlation. And then once you have the correlation, right, that was the one thing that we had to find first. And then we could find the slope and the intercept, interpret them, build our regression line, make predictions. Uh, and all that fun stuff. So uh, that was the hang up, right? So that's another way that these questions can start. Uh, this is an alternate way these questions can start. Okay. Good. Okay, and let me just get organized here. Okay, <laughs> so these last two pages uh, are really just for us to talk about. There's not a lot of notes, so I'm going to see if I can get away with just keeping them on the page and not moving them around so much. Okay, so now that we've built a model, right, we've built a regression line, a lot of effort goes into assessing the fit of that line, right? How good is it at predicting future values? How reliable are these predictions? And so, um, right, maybe I'll add that here, right, into assessing the fit of the straight line, right, which is really just saying uh, how reliable are the predictions is really what we're after. And so the problem is that if you just blindly fit a straight line to any data, you can, it, we can do that. Uh, 
even if the data isn't linear. So for us, there's a certain human component where we have to look at it and say, oh yeah, it looks linear, so we're gonna fit a straight line to it, okay? Um, and so the straight line model is only useful if we have linear data. So that's one of the conditions that we're kind of checking before we go ahead. Uh, and so some of the most common things that we do, and there are many other things that we could do, uh, but these are kind of the most common uh, bare bones. If, if you're going to do an analysis, then this, these should be included, right? And so first thing you have to report is your R squared, right? It tells us the percentage of the variability that this line has captured, right? Are we missing variables? Should we be adding a variable, which would be... Uh, multiple linear regression, right? Or maybe we just have some sort of multiple regression, right? And so um, we can do that. We can accommodate more than one X value, but not here, not now, okay? So R squared uh, tells us the percentage of variability and it's a really good gauge of, okay, how, how strong is this line? How good are these predictions? Uh, another thing that we do a lot is a residual analysis. Remember the residual is the distance from each point to the, the line, right? And so we call these residual plots when we plot on the y-axis, we plot the residual. And on the x-axis, we plot the explanatory variable. Okay. What's going to happen is we kind of get a line around zero. Remember, for the residuals, the residuals are the distances from the points to the line. They're going to be centered around zero because we've tried to minimize the distance from the actual points to the line, right? So we've tried to minimize the residuals. So that's why they're centered around zero. And, uh, and then we're gonna be, you know, some are negative or some are negative and some are positive, right? And so we're gonna want kind of random scatter around zero here, right? And so we're looking for this kind of uh, even random scatter around zero. And I think I don't have the word even, but maybe that's worth adding here. Um, so a residual plot, plots the residuals on the y-axis, right? So that's here. And the explanatory variable on the x-axis. Okay, so that's here. And then we look for, and here I'm gonna add even random scatter around zero for a well-fitting line. So if, if you're seeing kind of nothing happening here, just kind of random even scatter around zero, not too wide either, um, then you have a well-fitting line, okay? What I always found confusing about residual plots in the beginning is that they look basically the same as the regular scatter plot, okay? But the reason that we use them is because they kind of amplify what's going on, okay? So here, these are the scatter plots, okay? So these are kind of the original scatter plots. And these are the residual plots that correspond to them. So just looking at these without kind of knowing anything else. Okay, so if I looked at this data, even if there was no line here, I would call it linear. And I think a linear model is appropriate. Uh, and sure enough, looking at the residual plot, it looks pretty good, right? It looks like there's even random scatter around zero. And notice how there's a little dotted line here. That's the same as this line that I put on here. It's very common. Um, in fact, I don't know if it will produce a residual plot without it. So uh, anyways, so that's nice just as a kind of guide. Okay, here's zero. Um, and I'm seeing just kind of even random scatter around zero. So where it becomes useful is if you have something like this. Now, kind of 
if you look at it at a glance, it looks fairly linear, right? It's not until we look closer that we see, oh, okay, there's actually like some, some, so, some little curvature here, right? And so uh, there's a section where we are over predicting, under predicting, I always screw it up. Uh, and then it switches to the other side and all the points are above the line. And then it switches at some point and all the points are below the line. So here, we see that it's amplified uh, in the residual plots, right? So any uh, nonlinear behavior is amplified in the residual plots, which I will add here. Any nonlinear behavior is amplified in the residual plot, right? So that's good. Okay. And then uh, I want to talk about the other conditions before we have a look at this one here. Okay, but so in general for a residual plot, you're looking for even random scatter around zero. Okay, and then you have a well-fitting line. Okay. So there are a couple of things that we require. First of all, we need the data to be linear, right? To fit a straight line to it, that's fine. So the data should show a linear trend. Um, if you have a nonlinear trend, that's okay. You're just gonna need to study some more methods, right? This is kind of the basic, it works in many situations. Uh, and so, uh, it's gonna get you off the ground, right? But you could have nonlinear situations and just know that you can handle those. You're just gonna to have to maybe take another course or read another textbook. <gasps> what? No way, I know. Uh, so how do we check linearity? You can check it by looking at the scatter plot, right? Does it look like a linear model would be appropriate? Sure, or check the residual plot. And I've just emphasized what a residual plot is. Um, and it should show random scatter around zero for all values of x. Okay, and maybe I should add, should show even random scatter. There. Even, there. Um, okay, so that's the linearity condition. That's a big one. That's the major one, right? Is it a straight line? Can I use a straight line to model it? Uh, the next condition that we need to check is that we have nearly normal residuals. So once you have your data set and you have your line of best fit, you can also generate residuals, right? Each point is going to have a residual. So you can make a histogram of those residuals. Um, you can check normality using a histogram just by looking at it. So like here, right? nearly normal. Notice that it says nearly normal residuals. Okay, so just keep that in mind. There's some flexibility, right? But uh, when this condition is found to be unreasonable, it's usually because there are outliers or there might be some influential points, which, which we talk about in the next section. Okay, uh, so you can use it, check it, check it using a histogram, just kind of his, make a histogram of the residuals, right? Sorry, it's just lagging a bit here. So make a histogram of the residuals. Does it look nearly normal? Sure. Or remember the QQ plot? The QQ plot takes your actual points against the theoretical points, kind of the ideal situation if it was a perfectly normal distribution. Uh, and the closer your dots are to this diagonal line, the closer to a normal distribution you have. Notice that there is this kind of lift off in the upper end, and that's corresponding to this area here. Uh, so we see the same activity in either one of these. Often, uh, just for good measure, I'll produce both side by side and kind of look at them. Um, so there is some non-normality here in the tails, specifically the upper tail. Um, but in terms of nearly normal residuals, I would go ahead and say that here, this is nearly normal, right? And that is 
That is the condition that we're checking. Whoa, sorry, catching up. So nearly normal residuals, that's the condition that we're checking and it looks okay. Right. So you can check it using a histogram and or a normal probability plot, which is a QQ plot. Right. Maybe I should. Okay. Hey, okay, maybe the plot should be part of that. Normal probability plot is a QQ plot. Okay. So that's your second condition that you're checking. The third condition that you're checking, and there are four conditions, four conditions, four conditions, uh, four conditions that are we're going to check. Uh, the third condition is constant variability, and so uh, what this condition says is that the variability, so the spread of the points around the line, has to be roughly equal or constant around the line. Okay, so if they're uh, roughly equal, then it's called homoscedasticity. Don't make me say it again. Uh, it's really hard. <laughs> Almost here, I'm going to do it. Homoscedasticity. Um, okay, so what we're looking for is we want random, so constant random scatter around the line of best fit. And of course, uh, you can check the scatter plot and just make sure that that's true. Um, but this is where any deviation will be amplified in the residual plot. So you can check the residual plot and just make sure that you've got constant random scatter around zero, right? And so that's what we've been checking this whole time. So just checking the residual plot for constant random scatter around zero for all values of x that is checking all the conditions, right? Or at least the first three conditions. So what happens uh, if you have a scenario like this one, right? This third one where we had kind of like this shotgun situation. I'm not seeing it as super amplified here. So I want to do uh, another example where I just draw it out, but see how we've got the lines or the dots are closer to the line on the bottom end and then they start spreading out. Okay, so for um, non-constant variability, would look something like this, maybe. Uh, I'm going to draw my line. I at least draw it positive. And let's see here. Okay. Maybe something like this. So now notice that, okay, the line is doing a really good job of predicting down here, right? So here we get great predictions because all those points, they're behaving the same and they're all hanging out around the line. And though, even though this is the line of best fit, but because we have this kind of trumpet situation, right? And maybe I'll do it kind of up here, right? We have a very unreliable line of best fit, right? So our regression line all of a sudden is not giving us very good predictions because, well, some of these are over here and some of these are over here and we've got this huge spread. And so the problem is that R squared, R squared takes the relationship on average, right? It looks at the whole situation, all the data points and the line, how do they relate to the line? And so the R squared by itself would not be able to communicate this, right? It would take this really, really good fit here, down here, and, uh, and kind of average it out with this really, really bad fit up here, 
right? And so the R squared value, R squared would not capture uh, the difference uh, in um, how useful the line is for predictions. Right, so that's something to keep in mind. So uh, we want constant variability, right? We want that constant spread uh, and kind of even, um, even distribution around the line, both on the lower end and on the upper end. Okay, and again, we can use the residual plot to check that. The last uh, assumption or a condition that we need to check for a uh, least squares regression line is independent observations. Uh, which we've talked about before. There's no uh, graph to look at here. It's just you have to consider your data, right? You should be able to convince yourself, right? Is it reasonable to assume that the observations in your data are independent of each other, right? In this case, um, we're talking about the percentage of high school grads versus the percentage in poverty for different states. Yeah, I guess because we're still in the same country, we can assume that each state is independent of another state, right? Because they run themselves in theory, right? And so um, I guess I'm a little bit lukewarm, but that's, that's what we would have to argue, right? Uh, are these independent? Yes, because each state is their own uh, entity, right? In this case, or in this example, okay? Uh, I do have this uh, note here that be cautious about applying regression to time series data, right? Um, there's that underlying structure likely that should be considered in our model, which we would be ignoring if we just fit a straight line and, and got over it, right? Okay, so Great. So those are the four conditions that we need to uh, check if we're making a least squares regression line. What's tricky is uh, even though we're kind of, we have to do it after we fit the line, right? But then, so we fit the line, we kind of take our first stab at it, and then we check how well it fits the data. And if it doesn't fit the data well, then we go and try something else. Right, um, but we have to have the line before we can check how well it fits. Okay. okay, so the last section that I wanna talk about is just different types of outliers that we can have. Now, an outlier is an observation that lies outside the overall pattern of other observations. For example, here, I, <clears throat> they've done log transformations and that's okay. We're just going to kind of ignore that. We've talked about transformations. Uh, we haven't done them, but uh, here it transformed our data so that a linear model was reasonable, right? And so it's the log of the surface temperature and the log of the light intensity of 47 stars in the star cluster CYGOB1. No idea what that is, but the reason we have it is because we have this kind of lump of outliers, right? So notice what happens is uh, if we fit the line of best fit with outliers, then we get this kind of weird line across the, across the page here. We can tell that this is not gonna do a very good job of predicting anything right, for any value of x. Maybe, maybe around here, it does like sort of a reasonable job, right? And so here, this line um, does not give good predictions, right? So when we include the outliers in this case, 
right? The line is getting pulled towards these, these outliers and we call those influential, right? They're influencing the line. Whereas here, if we fit the line, so now if we remove these four data points, right? These four outliers and we fit the line, then we're able to get better predictions, right? And so uh, there's kind of a, a, an argument there, right? Should we be removing data points uh, only if it helps us get better predictions overall, right? Sacrifice a few for being able to pre uh, predict for many, right? Um, and then maybe just kind of look into what happened here. Is this a special case or are these special cases? Um, should they not be in this data set at all? Maybe they should be in a separate data set, that kind of thing. Okay, so in terms of um, <clears throat> points that are outliers in the y direction, right, of a scatter plot have large regression residuals. Um, but other outliers might not have large residuals. So it's not necessarily the size of the residual, uh, but it is the direction of the, of the outlier. So an observation is influential for a statistical calculation if removing it would markedly change the result of the calculation, right? So something over here. Points that are extreme in the X direction of a scatter plot are often influential for the least squares regression line. Okay, so notice that here, most of the X's are over here, right? Uh, and so let's see here, right? Kind of, this is the range of uh, usual X's. And so here, or maybe, not like that, right? These are outliers in the X direction. They're kind of sort of going with the flow in the Y direction. They're up a little bit higher than most of these um, if you kind of trace across, but they're not out of line in the Y direction, right? And so, uh, points that are extreme in the X direction of a scatter plot are often influential, right? And so that's what we're seeing here. Okay. So that's what extreme in the X direction is saying, right? If you're kind of, you've got most of your data points down here in this kind of range of X, and then if you've got some points that are outside that range of X, um, they're usually influential because they kind of teeter-totter that line towards them, okay? Uh, so outliers that lie horizontally away from the center of the cloud are called high leverage points. Um, and so horizontally is like this, right? And so just kind of in the X direction is what that's saying. are called high leverage points, right? So they're influential high leverage points. So high leverage points that actually influence the slope of the regression line are, call, are called influential points, right? So they, they're influencing the regression line. And so removing them would influence the line that you end up with the slope and the intercept. In order to determine if a point is influential, I want you to visualize the regression line with and without the point, right? Or you could even do the calculation, right? You could find the slope and the intercept um, and, and check them, right? Calculate the slope and intercepts to decide if points are influential, right? Did the slope change a lot, right? Did it change from a negative slope in this case to a very strong positive slope or a kind of a steep positive slope? 
that would be a huge change. So then I can say that, yeah, these are influential. Now what? Okay. Um, so the problem is that this regression line, as we can see, right, it kind of, uh, it's trying to accommodate all the points, right? And so if you have influential outliers, then what can we do, right? Um, of course, now I'm assuming that you're using some sort of software and what you're gonna do is you're gonna find the regression line with all of your data points, right? And then remove the suspected outlier or potentially outliers, but I would prefer it if you did it one by one, right? Uh, kind of most extreme to least extreme. And then find the outlier with the regression line uh, or sorry, find the regression line with outlier removed, right? Did the, did the line change significantly? Would it be better to remove the outlier or keep it? And then here, I wanna emphasize that our goal should always be to keep as much data as possible, okay? And so that's just something to keep in mind. I don't want you to be deleting data because, oh, it's changing my line a little bit and I don't like it, it looks ugly. No, we don't, we don't wanna be doing that, right? It's just in this case, like I said, we would remove these four data points because we're interested in modeling these many, right? We would still probably wanna analyze these, but maybe analyze them separately and see why are they so different from the rest of the pack here, right? So uh, it kind of opens up more analysis for you to do and, and it's never ending. Um, the last thing I want to just mention is lurking variables, okay? There could be something else that's going on kind of below the surface, right? And so lurking variables can make a correlation or a regression misleading, right? And so a lurking variable is one that's not among the explanatory or response variables. Um, and yet may influence the interpretation of relationships among those variables. And kind of the cutest example I could think of uh, or that I could find was, uh, I wish they didn't turn on the seatbelt sign so much. Every time they do, it gets bumpy, right? And so there's that lurking variable and that's just the last main thing that I want you to remember uh, when you're looking at regression lines, fitting lines of best fit, looking at correlation and all that fun stuff. But I'm pleased to report that that is the end. Not very nice, but I'll get Disney to do it. All right, so congratulations, you did it. See you in class.